So, bro, do you even science? Bros do science. chatting for about a couple of years and you're always generous uh, spreading out your knowledge and especially when we have like one-to-one -one conversations you're always generous to give me all the information I need and you're like that's the purpose of knowledge like exactly. well, knowledge is exactly. power when you spread it not to be it for yourself um, yeah it doesn't, it doesn't feel much good if it just rattles around up in here and people don't get to use it so Knowledge should be uh, free and, and freely given. Exactly. Um, before we start uh, for your, with your presentation, um, would you mind having a, uh, an intro about who's Brad Dieter? And, yeah, you want me to give you an overview of uh, who I am? Oh yeah, yes please. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, so uh, I guess I'll, I'll wind the clock back a little bit, probably not, you know, not too far, but um, Kind of growing up, I always wanted to be a, a doctor. Um, my dad was in clinical medicine, so I kind of grew up wanting to go that route. And then as I got closer to finishing undergrad, um, and spent a lot of time, you know, in, in hospitals and in clinical settings, I realized that just wasn't my skill set and wasn't my, you know, wasn't really what I was best at. Um, I was, I had a lot of other skills that I thought I could do more good in the world. So I went the, the research route, um, and kind of at the time when I was entering that phase of my life when I went into graduate school, I had the, I was kind of at that place where I think a lot of us get to where you kind of think, oh, everything about modern medicine and science is wrong, and you know, kind of the pendulum swings that way. So that's kind of where I was when I entered. Um, so I actually went through an exercise physiology program because I kind of wanted to see, I wanted to take the skills and knowledge and tools of how exercise affects chronic disease and apply that to the same medical framework. Um, and so that's kind of why, how I went through my master's and my PhD was, you know, basically looking at how is, how does exercise prevent chronic disease at kind of a, a molecular level. Um, and so that's kind of how I transitioned. Um, into what I'm doing now. So now my work is um, I'm specializing and focusing in um, metabolism and diabetic kidney disease. So that's kind of what I've gone with my, my clinical or basic science, translational science route. So that's kind of what I'm doing now. Awesome. And I think uh, and your postdoc ends uh, in a couple of months. You're yeah. Really so it's, it's, yep. Yeah. So now, now I've got to do the. Uh, the independent investigator thing, so it'll be it'll be interesting. Awesome, good luck, and uh, more to come, right? 
Yeah, hopefully. We'll uh, cross your fingers at the grant committee and start uh, throwing some money my way. Ooh, nice. That's easy for you. <laughs> so, let's track on. Uh, we're waiting for, uh, as we said, hot topics about um, carbohydrate metabolism. Um, just as you had an amazing uh, article once more about, like when you said about burying the boogeyman, when you said about fructose. Let's bury the yeah. boogeyman once more. Yeah, so we'll, uh, we'll definitely cover that. Um, so whenever you want me to get rolling, I can kind of just start uh, yeah. walking through some of the, the presentation. Just a quick hello from everybody. Oh, we got, we got a, a full room. Good morning. Full house. Full house. Yeah, so um, I'm also a pretty pretty informal person, so if questions pop up, you know, some of the audience has anything, just uh, let me know and we can kind of just stop and chat too if we need to. We've got a million. Whatever we can wait till the end, whatever works for everybody. You've got so. your bulletproof coffee. Uh, yes, I uh, I don't I tried that once. <laughs> that didn't end well for my uh, for my digestive yeah, system. Yeah, yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. <I know. laughs> Okay, awesome. Let's crack on and rock and roll with your uh, presentation. Yeah, let me just uh, pull it up. We should be ready to go. All right, uh, stock intro slide. Um, so, kind of here's, I wanted to break this down into three three topics, because um, there's really, when we talk about some of the big hot topics with carbohydrate metabolism, we can really start to break it down into three big areas. Uh, the first is, we'll kind of go through dissecting the carbohydrate um, insulin model of obesity. We will talk about rethinking the glycemic index um, based on some updated information we've gotten from some of the, the microbiome literature, and also you know, some of the metabolism literature. And then part three, we'll talk, um, this is a big chunk of the article we wrote on, on fructose metabolism, but how to think about fructose and kind of separating some of the hyperbole from the fact. Okay, awesome. All right, so uh, part one, let's, let's kind of dissect through this carbohydrate insulin model of obesity. So when we talk about the, the two prevailing thoughts of what drives obesity, we've essentially got uh, the first model, which is calories in, calories out model, which breaking it down to its most simple constituents and just trying to simplify it as much as possible is, you know, calories in versus calories out is a change in body composition. And it's basically, you know, as most people know, you consume more calories uh, than you expend, you're going to gain weight, and if you expend more calories than you consume, you're going to lose weight. So that's one of the prevailing theories or ideas. Um, the other one, also broken down as simple as possible, is the hormone model of obesity. Right when we strip away all of the, the, the technical jargon, is when we think about it as clearly as we can, is low insulin levels, either driven through diet or whatever mechanism, is that will cause you to lose weight. And if you have high insulin levels from um, specifically consuming higher amounts of carbohydrates, you're going to have. Uh, high levels of insulin present, and you're going to gain weight. So, are you talking more about the um, glycemic load, or just having more carbs than needed? So, um, it's we'll talk a little bit about that glycemic piece when we get to that index. But it's you know glycemic load, glycemic index, total carbohydrate load, all kind of affect um, insulin levels. Okay. So, if if we break that hypothesis down. Um, that's what it is. So this is a, I like this quote from David Deutsch. He's a, he's actually over in their neck of the woods, right? I think he's over at, or he used to be, he got, he was trained over in Cambridge, but he's a, a quantum physicist, but um, very hard for science. But in this quote of where we have good testable explanations, we have to test them, and we have to drop the ones that fail the test. So the carbohydrate insulin model of obesity makes several key predictions that we can actually test empirically fairly easily and fairly robustly, and then look at the data and come to a conclusion based on what the data tells us. Exactly. So the first prediction is that if that idea is true, isocaloric changes in dietary carbohydrate versus dietary fat have different effects on body fat and body weight. 
due to the fact that they have differing insulin responses in the body. Uh, the second one is that higher levels of fasting insulin should predict future weight gain. And then the third is that if insulin action, and that's a, that's the key word, is the primary driver of storing nutrients and fat tissue, then as we become more obese or we have more insulin present, we should actually see lower levels of both glucose and fatty acids in the blood. So let's, let's test prediction number one. So basically, this is what, if we kind of put the ideas that have been put forth in kind of a framework of, if you hold, if we use like carbs and fat on a scale and balance them, and those are the reference ranges, according to the hormone model, if we decrease dietary carbohydrates and increase dietary fat, we should see a decrease in fat mass. And conversely, if we increase the ratio or the amount of dietary carbs and reduce the amount of dietary fat, we should see an increase in fat mass. Now, this has been tested um, quite a bit, but probably the two best papers have actually come out recently. Um, this is the first one. This was a more short-term-ish acute study um, in a metabolic ward where they looked at, now this is from Dr. Kevin Paul, it's a fairly long paper at this point, but essentially what they did was they randomized people in kind of a, uh, you know, a design where they gave them five days of eating a eucaloric, so they shouldn't be losing weight, and then either restricted dietary carbohydrates or they restricted dietary fat. So if the carbohydrate insulin model of obesity is correct, even after about six days of a calorie restriction, we should start to see some benefit to each one or the other. So when you actually look at the study, here's kind of the, the breakdown is there was really no major difference between overall body weight, um, but there was probably a slight edge to restricting dietary fat. So this is actually the complete opposite of what the carbohydrate insulin model of obesity predicts. Now this was fairly short term, six days, so there was some, you know, some discussion that this wasn't a long enough time period, and there were also people were, you know, some of the criticisms of the paperwork, it wasn't low enough carbohydrate to see an effect. So they actually followed this study up um, with another study, and this was published in the uh, American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And essentially, they did a fairly similar study, but they went longer. Um, so they went about two weeks, and they did a very similar thing where they had a, a, a lead-in diet, and then they randomized people to either a restricted carbohydrate or a restricted fat model. And in this case, it was the restricted carbohydrate was a ketogenic diet and the moderate ketone levels and all that kind of stuff. Um, but here's here's the, the main findings from the paper is when you look at the uh, dietary restriction of carbohydrate versus dietary restriction of fat, and you look at the data points is, again, following the same paper is the restriction of dietary carbohydrates did not lead to a greater fat loss. In fact, it may have actually led to a little bit less fat loss over time. So this is data point number two that directly contradicts the um, hypothesis straight out. Now here's some other key pieces to the paper. Um, and this was this paper also kind of addressed the uh, the metabolic advantage that is often claimed um, for very low carbohydrate diets due to ketone metabolism. And if you kind of look for boxes, you can see the people when they were on a ketogenic diet from day 10 to, I think it was about, or day 14 to about day 28, 29, um, they were obviously in ketosis, right? Their, their levels were increased. Their fatty acid levels in the blood were increased. Um, but the the claim of a metabolic advantage is kind of this change in free energy, or the, the change in energy expenditure, and it actually decreased initially um, over the course of the study. So if anything, it may have gone in the opposite direction. Now, it wasn't significant. It was such a small number, it probably wasn't anything super meaningful. But two of the most well-controlled studies essentially reject the hypothesis based on that first prediction. So the first prediction appears to be um, falsified through empirical data. 
So now prediction number two, if we go back, um, that was the one that said fast input levels predict um, future weight gain. So um, there's actually been several studies that have looked prospectively um, at whether fast levels of insulin actually do predict future weight gain. So this was a review paper by Hibbert um, and colleagues. It was in the International Journal of Obesity. And when they pulled all the studies, and you, you actually, if you go through and you read through all the studies that they list and comb through them and kind of look at the models and when they're fully adjusted and everything is, almost all of the studies showed either a negative association or no association. And there was one study that showed an, a positive association. So this was the smallest of all the sample sizes, um, except for one by Schwartz out of the at University of Washington. But overall, the idea that fasting levels of insulin, so even or not, yeah, yeah, essentially there is no predictive capability of this to predict future weight gain. So that's two of the three predictions that we've shown to be false. Um, the other prediction, which is prediction number three, is one of the key ideas of the, the carbohydrate insulin model of obesity is that this presence of insulin due to dietary carbohydrates increases insulin action, which increases uptake of nutrients into fat cells, causing it to store as body fat. Now, one of the things we know um, before we even talk about the data is the rise in insulin that occurs in obesity is due to a insulin resistance at a cellular level. Um, and so that actually affects how the insulin action actually works. So if we look at the data is, as people become you know, heavier and heavier, insulin rises, glucose actually rises along with it, which suggests that insulin actually isn't doing what it's supposed to do. So that means both in the peripheral tissue and um, in the liver, is it's not doing what it's supposed to do to regulate blood glucose levels. Now, additionally, we would also suspect that it would um, lower levels of fatty acids in the blood. It's actually increases in the uptake of fatty acids in the fat tissue. But that also is important because as we as we increase levels of obesity in faster in uh, fat insulin levels go up, we actually also see an increase in free fatty acids. So of the three major predictions that this model makes, all three of them are falsified by empirical data. Mm -hmm. So when we really kind of look at look at the hypothesis um, in that model, is none of them that holds up across any of the testable predictions. Like, so I think it's, we're kind of at the point where more investment into this hypothesis or a big opportunity cost to you know the field in terms of people's time and also money, right? Of all the empirical Oh, go ahead. So we check because you know we've got everybody's talking about um, insulin, right? How about IGF? Mm -hmm. Like sometimes it's a hundred percent more than the liver. Uh, like we always focus yeah. on in insulin and we lose like the liver, and you're like uh, we've got hundred yeah. percent more here, and we've got like one here, and we always focus on the liver and the pancreas about insulin. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your yeah? So that. Um, you know, I think that's one of the interesting aspects is, you know, most people have this idea of, you know, insulin being a actor on peripheral tissue like fat and muscle tissue. But when you really look at what it does, is its main job is to regulate uh, liver production of both glucose and IGF. So that, that axis actually needs to be looked at a lot more closely. Um, and it's... A lot of the the rise in blood glucose we see from people with you know insulin resistance and, and type two diabetes is a result of essentially not being able to break the hepatic glucose output. Isn't there also if, it's, if we lack uh, lack of potassium that will also increase that right? So it's more not that simple or not? <laughs> yeah. So it's it's de definitely not that simple, right? Um, it's it was kind of, this also goes along with the lines of research that looked at magnesium deficiency um, and all sorts of other stuff that, you know, we know contributes to insulin dysfunction and, and uh, lipid dysfunction, but whenever we key in on those, like, key micronutrients, um, it, it just appears that the overall panel of those micronutrients is, is not 
they're not at optimal levels, right? So you can pick any of those key ones, and most people who are, you know, obese and have type 2 diabetes and have some sort of insulin resistance are dysregulated amongst all of those micronutrients. So it's, it's kind of hard to say it's just potassium or it's just magnesium yeah. um, or it's any of those. But I think, you know, again, it's, they're all small pieces that contribute to this metabolically dysfunctioning cog of meals. So if you were, sorry, if you were saying that obviously some, most obese people um, do have some form of insulin resistance, but you're saying that the amount of insulin in the blood when you're fasting isn't a measure of obesity, what is that? Can you repeat that real quick? Um, so if you're saying that um, that's a measure of obesity if someone has a uh, loss of insulin resistance, is that mm -hmm. correct? But uh, obviously if they do tend to have a lot of insulin resistance, they're likely to have elevated levels when tested fasted, mm -hmm. which goes yeah. against this statement. Um, so can you just clarify that? What do you think is a good measure of obesity then? Or uh, sorry, uh, obesity. Oh, that's a good measure of future obesity. <laughs> that's a that's really a question, right? A lot of them, you know, a lot of the research that looks at what are predictors of, of you know future weight gain. One of them that one of them is you know starting BMI, right? If you're if you're overweight to begin with, your likelihood of continuing to gain weight is higher. Um, you can look at you know sadly socioeconomic status is another one. Um, You've got activity levels, and you've got overall calorie intake. So all of those kind of key pieces are a lot better predictors of future weight gain um, than anything else. You um, you had on your website, uh, Science Driven Nutrition, for anyone that doesn't know, quick plug, um, about body weight regulation. Um, you were sort of saying that it was about yeah. a fat metabolism problem. Yeah, so that's also a, an interesting um, aspect. You know, a lot of times we hear that people with insulin resistance have a carbohydrate metabolism problem. Uh, um, but when you kind of parse through a lot of the, the metabolic data, and you look at people who are, you know, have type 2 diabetes, and you look at their respiratory exchange rate, um, they actually tend to show that they have impaired basal fat metabolism. Um, now, it's kind of a little bit interesting in the fact that they are their shift to carbohydrates is, is also different. Um, but we kind of have this false assumption that because of insulin resistance, your your body can't use carbs, so you should use more fat. Well, it, just at baseline, most people actually have a fat metabolism problem, right? Their ability to oxidize fatty acids just at normal levels. Um, is impaired. And the interesting thing too is when you look at the exercise literature and you take somebody who is you know insulin resistance or type 2 diabetes or even you know moderately obese and you have them exercise at the same level relative level so if you take their VO2 max relative to their you know max output and you have them exercise and a lean person exercise the lean person will be using more fatty acids at you know about 40 to 60 percent of the VO2 max, whereas uh, an obese person will be using uh, more carbohydrates because their ability to oxidize fatty acids at just lower levels is impaired. Okay. Well, let's continue because we uh, started <laughs> shooting. You know, so hey, that's all right. Perfect. It's, um, it's okay, uh, like so we're treating. We'll move on to, to part two now, which is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Because uh, Lyle McDonald had an amazing um, podcast now with um, Sigma Nutrition and Danny Lennon and talking about um, carb load. Oh. So that's going to be really interesting to hear your uh, uh, side. Yeah. Um, so this will, this will probably be a little bit different than you know, Lyle's. Uh, I've listened to a lot of his work. I think his concepts and ideas of just the load are, are, are pretty spot on, but this is actually probably a, a much different take on it. Uh, so that's why I titled it Rethinking the Glycemic Index. So when we really, what we've been taught you know, in school and um, from popular consumption of information is, you know, the glycemic index is essentially just this idea that specific foods uh, based on their, if we really simplify it is 
the amount of simple carbohydrates they have, they have this higher glycemic index, so they cause higher excursions in the blood glucose. So something high on the glycemic index, um, you know, if you eat it, you'll have a high spike of blood glucose. Something, you know, low on the glycemic index uh, is going to have much lower. That's what we're traditionally taught and kind of, we basically say this food, you know, white bread is traditionally the reference range. Um, this is going to cause a high excursion in blood glucose um, in everybody. But this, uh, so this is kind of what I wanted to talk a little bit about is this paper by ZV in, in colleagues, I was actually at um, the conference when he first presented this data in person, and it was pretty mind-blowing just to hear him talk about it, but essentially what they did is they wanted to actually test this idea that we've all thought is you know, pretty um, locked and tight that you know, these foods have these pretty standard glycemic responses. Um, and when you, what, so basically what they did, oops, there we go. Basically what they did was they took 800 people, um, they attached them to these continuous glucose monitors so they were able to track their blood glucose, and they fed them different foods, and then they just basically individualized people's responses to very standard foods that we use to establish this glycemic index. So kind of these figures on the right is, if you aggregate all the 800 people and you look at their glucose responses to glucose, bread, um, bread with butter, and then fructose, is you actually see this wide distribution of responses. And even something just as simple as glucose, which we would assume would have a very similar glucose response in every person, has this wide distribution, right? How much their glucose response to that is highly different. And then um, on the bottom is the figure where they took, so we've got participants 67, 663. So basically these are four different participants, um, and they fed them bread. So they all got the exact same food, um, which should give the same glucose response, and they all had drastically different responses. So basically it's like, you know, Rocco, you and I go out and grab some ice cream. Um, your response... <laughs> or uh, gelato, right? Um, <laughs> your, <laughs> good story, so <laughs> yeah, your your response is going could be completely different from mine. Exactly. Um, and that's a very very novel concept and something I don't think anybody has had ever thought of before. Why can't you, uh, sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. If this, would you say that's actually just down to possibly a genetic predisposition, or is that down to the, their digestive system and how fast they can absorb it? Um, yeah, so they, did I put that data in here? Um, so in this paper, they actually looked at several different things that could affect it, um, and one of the big ones was the microbiome, um, and they, which is a part of the digestive piece, right? Of what your, your microbiome is made of actually dictates a lot of how your body responds to different types of food. Um, so basically, you know, what it comes down to is, whether it's genetic, uh, whether it's, you know, what your training history is, whether it's your microbiome, um, you know, whether it's some genetic component, this idea of a glycemic index as a useful tool doesn't really seem to make any sense. Well, um, when Jenkins started in the 1980s, he was, because uh, uh, people were, didn't know even how to eat, okay? But then it started mm -hmm. to become a dogma that, oh, we don't need to eat this as GI, uh, like GI really high or GI really low. But the thing is, if, if it, you combine it with sucrose or you combine it with fructose, then if you, the load changes. Then they were saying that potatoes were, uh, or potatoes were um, um, worse. Uh, but then ice cream was had a lower glycemic index. And you're like, so should I start eating ice cream? That's good. Because I hate <laughs> you know what I mean. Like we all yeah. find something, load it up, and it doesn't work like that. Especially when it's about health and people are having like yeah. issues like Precise. type one or type two or you know. Yeah. So there's really you know when we stop and think about the glycemic indexes, there's a lot of reasons why as a tool, um, it's it's not super useful to most people. Right? I mean, one, there's this new data that shows that it, it's so variable across 
people that it doesn't, it's not really accurate. Um, you know, you and I obviously are going to have very different responses to food. Two is it, it basically takes a food and strips away any of the context, any of the meaning, any of the additional properties of that food and gives it some arbitrary number um, that you might be able to use to predict how much insulin you give yourself after you eat it if you're a diabetic that's either type 1 or has gotten to the point where in type 2 you no longer produce insulin, right? So it's it's kind of one of those indexes that it's, it's clinical practical utility is becoming more and more limited the more we understand. Um, so now part three is, is how to think about fructose. So this is um, this is one of those topics I think has gotten a lot of play and has been talked about a lot, but I don't think has really been talked about in kind of the correct light in terms of what the actual context is and how to actually think about it. So let's first start with the epidemiological data. So I decided I would take all of these big epi studies and break them down into uh, the most simple graphs I could. So <laughs> when you uh, when you look at all of the data, um, there's there's you know probably 10 to 15 decent epi style fructose consumption um, data, and when you kind of categorize them is they fall into three very different categories. Uh, the one is that as you increase fructose intake, a badness, just general badness, right? Whether that's obesity, hyperglycemia, hyperlipidemia, fatty liver disease, whatever marker you want to associate with badness increases. Now there's also several different um, association studies, epi studies, that show it has no effect. And then there's even some, when you look at some of the, uh, the initial type 2 diabetes intervention literature where you basically sub out glucose from fructose, you actually, the more fructose you consume up to a point, you actually have uh, decreased values, right? Your, your blood glucose control improves because it, you know, it's metabolized differently because of that to the glucose load of the meals, etc. So that's one of the things is the results are all over the place. Now, one of the problems is a lot of people have used some of these studies that kind of fall into this category to say that, well, if high fructose consumption is associated with bad outcomes, we should all avoid it. Um, well, correlation is not causation. Right? That's something we should teach people in, in third grade. Okay. Um, and this is this is from uh, this this guy Tyler Vigan, who he has this website called Spurious Correlations. It's worth spending 15 minutes reading them because they're kind of funny. So here's you know random things can be correlated and they have nothing to do with each other. Right. So here's one of the data points that he put together where suicides by hanging strangulation and suffocation were associated with um, how much we spend on science based and technology. <laughs> right? There's, there's, no, there's no causal link between those except for maybe, you know, more grad students get depressed from being in the lab more, but, you know, that's, that's uh, these, these correlations have nothing to do with each other. Um, here's another one of people who trap <laughs> <people> body <laughs> It's a broom conversation. You brought people to skate on stage, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I mean there's just it's it's one of those things where associate association data or epi data is really at best hypothesis generated. Um, and those studies need to be done because that's how you start to think about large problems, but we can't but we can't um, infer causal relations or mechanism off the meat. So what we need to do is we really need to look at the biological data. So what actually happens when you consume fructose? Um, so the, probably the, the, the source of trying to determine what happens when you actually consume fructose is to use, they're called isotopic tracer studies. So basically, you can take fructose or glucose or whatever, and you can label these to radioisotopes, um, and then you can follow where they go in the body. Mm -hmm. And there's actually been a, a lot of studies done, um, and you can actually go through and you can go through that research and look at what actually happens. So most 
What you hear from most people um, is that you know when you do fructose is well, it's 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 a, a different you know carbon. The, it's carbon structure and its carbon ring is different. So your body can't metabolize it. It has to get metabolized to the liver. Gets metabolized to like alcohol. It causes non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Da, 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 da. But what happens when you actually look at the the data in those studies? Um, let me just move this real quick. Here's, here's the fate of fructose. So when you consume it, um, it does essentially get taken up through your intestines, through the um, hepatic coral vein, and into your liver, where it is metabolized in the liver. But 38 to 82% of it, depending on which study you look at, is actually initially oxidized for energy. Right? You've got some, some, um, some enzymes that can just basically convert fructose into a molecule that goes straight into the glycolysis and can be utilized for energy. Can I ask you a question there? Uh, also, depending on the stuff. Yeah. So, everything passes from the GI tract, right? right? I'm like, like yep. I'm five mm -hmm. years old now. Mm -hmm. And you've got people that are saying, look, if you've got fructose, it goes straight into the liver. I'm like, no, it's so go down and then come up. <laughs> Can you explain that? Yeah, so no. Everybody yeah. says if you eat fructose, that's yeah. liver. So it doesn't go from the GI tract, maybe it takes a tax or something, but can we just, you know, bury that boogeyman about fructose goes exactly from the liver, it doesn't pass from the GI thing. No, it, it, it goes through your GI tract, but uh, the, the, the receptors that pull it out of your GI tract um, actually pull it into the hepatic coral vein and then it goes it goes through your GI tract, then your hepatic coral exactly. vein, and then your liver. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't just like <laughs> quantum tunnel from your stomach into your, your liver, right? And it, it's, it's, it, it's gone all the oh, yeah. traditional digestive. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so a big chunk of oxidized for energy, uh, another huge chunk of it is converted to glucose, and then uh, about 28% of it is converted to lactate and then exported. And less than 1% of it is converted to lipid. Okay. Now, this holds true when you look at isotopic tracer studies, anywhere from 50 to 150 percent of fructose and estrogen. Now, as you get to the 150, a little bit more starts getting converted into lipids. Um, but that's still, it's still such a small percentage um, that contributes to postprandial lipidemia that it is. It's not really super meaningful in the context of what most people talk about, right? Most of the times we hear, oh, you, you drink a can of Coke, your whole blood turns like, you know, like Pemmick, and it's just bad. And um, when you actually look at how it's metabolized, it, that's just not true at all. Can um, can so now that is just isotopic. Oh, sorry, yeah. Sorry to use Go for it. Just obviously with regards to this, because oh, no, you're good. if um, if if uh, just can get if fructose just get converted into glucose. And obviously that's stored in the liver as glycogen, but or your stores are full, the body converts the glucose into lower density lipids via HMB overductase, as far as I know. So what would happen in, in that if you're actually consuming enough and your glucose stores are full, will you not get an increase in conversion to lipids? Yeah, you actually, um, so that's, you know, fast versus fat state metabolism is a little bit different, um, and you will have acute increases in, in triglycerides once you start to consume to the point where you've kind of fully saturated that, that piece. Um, so that is true, but that, again, you have to remember that's in the context of excess energy consumption, um, which is actually a very important distinction. Yeah, yeah so it's Fructose in the context of, you know, caloric excess, which you can say the same thing about glucose. You can say the same thing about, you know, anything. Well, we, we were having just before so we started, the, we, oh. we, we were having a discussion just before we started with some of the audience members about actually putting things into context. So if someone asks me, you know, should I have food, should I have fructose, etc., really defining what they're after, their goal first, whether, you know, if you've got someone who wants to be super lean versus a power lifter versus someone who needs it for their health. You need to define that first before you can give that advice. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, absolutely, right? Context is the probably one of the single most important variables whenever you're working with actual people, um, because that's what takes everything to you. So, you know, moving on from the, the isotopic tracer studies, you know, what actually happens in, you know, intervention studies, where we give people, you know, large amounts of glucose or fructose, and what actually happens to them as people. So this was an intervention study um, that they basically took normal lean people. I used the uh, ninjas as stick figures because why not, right? Um, so this is essentially what they did was they they fed these people what I would consider obscene amounts of fructose. So for I, you know I weigh about 85, 87 kilograms, um, and so I kind of converted it to how much it would have given me if I was a subject, and if on the bottom, so an 85 kilogram male, if I take in 128 grams of straight fructose in a day, over, I can't remember the exact time frame of the study, but it was a decent amount of time, is there was absolutely no change to insulin sensitivity, blood lipids, or uh, hepatic fat, so liver fat. Now, 128 grams of fructose in a day is a substantial amount of fructose, right? So if you've got people who, I mean, that's, uh, that is about seven apples. Um, it's about two two liters of Mountain Dew. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a substantial amount of fructose, and there still and there still wasn't you know that much. There was no change. Now, when they got you know 255 grams of fructose. They started to notice decreased insulin sensitivity, um, increased hepatic fat accumulation, but that also happened with the 255 grams of consuming just straight glucose in a day. Exactly what we said. It's so what it suggests, it's about being next to that. Whatever it is. Yeah. So what that suggests is it's not really the. Yeah. So it really appeared that the dose problem with fructose. Doesn't appear to be fructose, it appears to be a dose problem of nutrients. Yeah. Now, this is a mean, right? So, how does this context change when we have, you know, more, more overweight ninjas, right? So, Super. these people, um, they, took, they took overweight people, and I think the BMI of the study was, was over 28 or over 30. And they fed them 135 grams of fructose a day, or they fed them 35 grams of glucose per day. So these people were overweight, insulin resistant, um, and they had some other problems. But at 135 grams of overweight people, they did see an increase in 24 hours triglycerides. And you know, most people would say, okay, well that's you know, that's a fructose problem. But still, if you remember, I mean, that's a substantial amount of fructose to take in a day. Um, but when they gave those same people 35 grams of glucose, they saw that they had increased blood sugar excursions and they had a higher insulin release response um, that they didn't see with the fructose. So it's kind of a, a trade-off here of, you know, fructose has some interesting properties that it's, it doesn't cause insulin excursions, uh, it doesn't cause blood glucose excursions, but when you have some metabolic problems um, in your your liver's already having some hepatic glucose output problems due to being obese and insulin resistant, is large amounts of fructose can increase 24 hours like this, right? So there's kind of this, this dynamic between these two pieces. So now, one of the other big, big key issues, right, is if you look at these studies, 135 grams of fructose, 128, 255, or 340 is, what does that tell us about actual real-world fructose consumption and what that actually means in terms of the larger context of the population and how much of a problem is it? So when you go into the, the NHANES data, uh, which is the, the National Survey of Health and, and Food Intake and all that kind of stuff in the United States that's been done for a long time, is the mean fructose intake for people, you know, here's, here's, a, here's a range between 2 to over 70 is the average person at the highest age group, which is teenagers, right? As teenagers, we just eat whatever we want. I think I lived on, you know, Mountain Dew and muffins when I was like 13. That's just what, that's just what we do. 
Oh, yeah. Um, so you're going to nail the highest intake. And that is, that's still about, you know, half to a quarter of what they were giving these people in these intervention studies. So this is a this is a quote I like this quote from um, Lise, who's done a lot of research in fructose. Uh, by focusing on the adverse effects of very high and excessive doses, we risk not noticing the potential benefits of moderate to higher doses, which might moderate the advance and progress of type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and might even contribute to longevity. Uh, the, the last sentence is, is the piece that I want to really key on is. A salutary rather than hyperbolic examination of the evidence needs to be undertaken. Now that sentence right there tells us a lot about most of what we see in the, the nutrition scene, um, the diet scene is there's usually too much hyperbole and not enough examination of the actual evidence. So even these intervention studies that have been done are at doses that are not really reflective of what the real world problem is. So there's been studies looking at what is the effect on, on you know, health and metabolism of these intakes at doses that normal people intake. So if you take about 90% of the population, they consume less than 100 grams of fructose a day. Um, and then you can break it down into more than 100 grams. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these studies, uh, if, you, if you take all the studies and you pool the data, you kind of do you know, some interesting statistics is if you if you cut it off at 100 grams a day and you look at intakes of that, there appears to be no association of fructose intake up to 100 grams a day in bad outcomes. Now, if you are consuming more than 100 grams a day, you start to see a dose problem um, with fructose intake. But that same effect appears with almost any other nutrient intake. You get to these higher levels. So it's really not the fructose per se, but it's a dose problem of nutrients. So kind of when you when you break it down and you summarize all of all of the literature and everything we know about fructose and, and what its role is in a lot of these chronic health disease problems is it's not fructose per se that's the issue. It's the overconsumption of in large quantities, and it's in the context of consuming fairly large amounts of fructose along with being in a caloric excess yeah. that really drives the problem. So those are uh, those are the big hot topics, and that's some of the data. Um, so I would be happy to answer any questions or you know um, talk about whatever you guys have left. That was amazing information, and literally uh, not over sciencing and trying to have a proper um, um, understanding of. Um, not simple, but everyday stuff that people uh, have having a difficult understanding. Um, also, I've got on tape that you told me that you're going to eat ice cream, so I'm going to keep that. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. Plus, we need to snatch and lift at some point. Because um, I know yeah, you're absolutely. a massive Olympic lifter, so we need to do that. As for questions, guys, he's not. Oh. I'll turn it to he's big, he's big, big. <laughs> Alright, uh, when it comes to body composition, what are your views on um, carb cycling, the effectiveness, and what should it be used? What should it be used at all? Uh, <laughs> uh, I, think it's a, I think it's an effective dietary tool. I don't know if there's any data to support it being having any substantial advantage over anything else from like a, a fat loss perspective. I think what it is a good way to do is, I think pragmatically speaking, is it's a way to control calorie intake um, for a given week and still have periods where you have enough carbohydrate intake in, in large boluses to get good amounts of training in. Um, I think it's also a, a decent way to have you know, lower calorie intake with not suffering some of the the potential side effects that can come from using low carb diets for long periods of time. Will it affect uh, hormone levels? Uh, yeah, so it 
The, the idea that low-carb diets can affect hormone levels uh, really differs across different populations. So if you've got people who are, you know, um, athletes and who have kind of hectic, busy lives, it's, those people typically can have, are more at risk of having some adverse hormone responses to low-carbohydrate diets um, than, you know, other people who are fairly sedentary, training three or four times a week, and are using it as a way to control calories. I think a lot of those average daily people, like even myself, I would say at this point in my life and career is I'm just another average daily person, and my training load is, you know, eight, nine hours a week at max. I, could, I probably would not have any substantial changes in you know, hormone issues and things like that following something like a, a carb cycling diet for even long periods of time. Alright, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Doesn't bite. <laughs> Any others? Okay, Brad, yeah, I've got, just got some questions. So if we just go back to the fructose, and if we, if we put it into context and we say, right, so we've got someone who wants to get exceptionally lean, is it a fair mm -hmm. statement? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, to all, to all. Um, that uh, is it a fair statement to say that if if you want to get exceptionally lean and still want to consume fructose, the only thing that is important is whether you are in a calorie deficit or surplus as to whether that will make a difference. Yeah, you know, I would probably say that's the correct interpretation. Um, as, as far as I'm aware of, there's no there's no good you know, theoretical model or hard data that's been published to show that fructose has any effect on body fat um, in the negative way when consumed in a calorie deficit. Uh, I think that there's, I mean, you also got to think about this kind of as, as a real world application scenario, right? If you're somebody who's trying to be super lean, you're obviously going to be dieting down. So your likelihood of having a, an ice, or a hypocaloric diet while you know, having 70 to 80 grams of, of fructose um, from, um, you know, Mountain Dew or, I don't know, whatever other things people drink with a lot of fructose. Oh, you're missing that one. Excuse me. So, uh, so I think it's, you know, I, there's no data to suggest that, you know, having decent amount of fructose intake while being in a calorie deficit is going to affect any ability to, to lean down. Um, and also, practically speaking, when you're in some sort of a, an isocaloric diet, just the food choices you have available to stay there is you're probably not going to be consuming a lot anyway. Okay. But uh, yeah, the idea, that, the idea that eating an apple um, is going to prevent you from getting down to four or five percent. <laughs> it seems a little bit um, ridiculous just on its face when you think about it. Um, Brad, what's your opinion about P53, the uh, uh, gen guardian, and carbs? Uh, did you say P53, like the tumor suppressor molecule? Yes. Ah, uh, what? That's so getting into uh, cancer metabolism. Uh, how much time you guys got, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so we go, oh, here's, <laughs> here's the uh, damn. Yeah. Maybe I'll bring it back to a larger perspective, and then we can hone in on on P fifty three. So, cancer metabolism is so complex um, and so opportunistic that, you know, pinning it down on any one nutrient appears to miss most of the research, right? Is we know cancer is essentially an opportunistic uh, entity. I, I, I kind of have to anthropomorphize it because there's really no other way to think about it. But, you know, it, it runs on glucose, it runs on fatty acids, it runs on ketones. It'll pull exosomes in from its, you know, tumor microenvironment and metabolism and a whole lot of things. Now, carbohydrate metabolism. Yeah. Oh, pardon me? Stress, environment, they're like, when we're talking about cancer, it's everything. Yeah. So, now a little bit more specific to um, carbohydrate metabolism in P53 is 
how P53 is regulated is so complex, and it has so many different things that affect it, right? You've got you've got a whole lot of different signaling pathways that can be upregulated and downregulated um, by carbohydrate metabolism, by overall energy status, uh, by micronutrition, all sorts of stuff. So I don't I don't find any compelling data to show that carbohydrate metabolism is enough perturbation in the system to push P53 towards any pro-cancer um, environment. Now, there's probably some specific genetic mutations in cancer, um, specific types and specific, you know, strains or whatever that can be key enough to do that. But largely speaking, in the larger context, I don't think there's enough to, to warrant that is a, any useful hypothesis at this point. Yeah, so your uh, post on uh, you tagged Alan Aragon about uh, the metastasis. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was yeah. Yeah, that's the uh, the whole dietary interventions um, for cancer and what those actually mean and how those need to be interpreted. I think is something we need to do a lot better job of controlling internally before we bring that discussion to a larger audience because it's so easy to go from. You know, there's a pilot study in one very specific type of cancer that we have, you know, phenotyped and, you know, metabolism typed more than any, any other one, and that, you know, there may be some minor benefit increasing longevity by two months in those people eating a low-carb ketogenic diet because it's a very specific type of cancer to ketogenic diets cure cancer. I mean, those are the type of leaps of logic that I don't think are very helpful when the message goes from a research context to a large group of people. Yeah, because there's lots of opinions with uh, um, less understanding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, I've got more questions. First of all, respect for answering that. I, I could never have answered that question. <laughs> um, I wanted to talk to you about non-specific gluten sensitivity. Uh, yeah, non celiac gluten sensitivity. Because uh, you've had a cheeky little mention there of the microbiome, uh, microbiome, how you say it. Um, but I come from a uh, background of re uh, reading books like Wheat Belly and The Brain Maker, which go into and, um, the uh, second brain, etc., that go into real details about the microbiome and how important that is. Um, and I just wanted to, to kind of get your input on it. Um, because, you know, I'm probably one of the people. In rock and I might differ on our opinions of it. Um, I, I find myself horrifically sensitive to gluten um, at times, um, and it's not something mm -hmm. I imagine. And obviously, everyone's symptoms can differ on this, but he didn't see your post yesterday on Facebook. Yeah, I know, I, 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 I did. Yeah, that's what I wanted to talk to you about it. Yeah, um, so I guess you know, I'm actually working on an article right now. Um, on the, on the topic, so when it comes out, I'll, I'll send it to you. It'll probably better articulate my ideas than I can do right now, but uh, I'll kind of break down some of the, I'll try to break it down as, as much as I can here. So there's there's a few ways to really think about it, um, and we'll kind of start in the weeds and kind of pull it back into a little bit of a conversation, is the microbiome appears to actually play some role in gluten metabolism. Um, there's Sergio Fontinas, I'm sure you guys are aware of him, he, he was the one who sent me a lot of this research to look over as a writing his post is, gluten can be metabolized by a lot of the microbiome. Um, and there's specific strains that metabolize it more than others, and so consuming gluten can increase the activity of some of those those bacteria in your stomach. Now, some of those appear to be you know, what we call beneficial bacteria, um, and some of those appear to be more harmful, as in they release a lot of you know, matrix metallic proteinases, they break down some of your stomach lining, etc. So there could be some there could be some cases where the microbiome is beneficial at that it can break down gluten or remove some of the potentially problematic proteins, or it could be that gluten is feeding some of the uh, potentially problematic bacteria in your stomach. Those are kind of, from my read of the literature, those are kind of the two possibilities with how the microbiome and in gluten interact. Now, I, from what I've been able to read, I can't really tell you 
of which way the answer is going to fall and might be person specific. Um, I, I'm not 100% sure what the answer is going to turn out to be. I just, I, I just really don't know at this point. Um, but I think that's going to be an area where we need to kind of investigate a little bit further. Now, we kind of step back a little bit and talk about the ideas of gluten-free diets and non-gluten sensitivity and, and wheat allergy. Um, there's, I kind of have a few different ways I think about it. And, and putting on, we'll talk about the, the, the hardcore science side first, and then we can put on more of a kind of a pragmatic, real-world approach, is when you talk about the science and evidence of gluten, non-gluten sensitivity, and wheat allergy, and then also some of the you know hypotheses in books like Gray Brain and Wheat Belly, um, of some of the other more long chronic things like, like Alzheimer's and stuff, is the best way to summarize that data is there is this very small percentage, about 0.7% of the population that has over celiac disease. They present with the genetic, um, the genotype, and they have the autoimmune condition as diagnosed by serological or antibody tests. Um, if, you, if you take everybody's non-gluten celiac um, sensitivity or non-celiac gluten sensitivity claims as face value, um, and say they do have an allergic reaction to gluten. You're looking at, we can average it out to about 7% of the population, right? So that means there's about 8% of the population who have clinically manifested symptoms of, of, of eating gluten and what happens. And those you know, responses can range all over the place. And of, of all the research out there, those people are likely to benefit from just eating gluten free. It, I mean, Unfortunately, the uh, the rise in popularity has made it easier for people, um, and there's there's really there's really decent scientific and logical reasons to say you know if you've got a reaction to it, just don't eat. It. I mean, it makes your life better. It's not going to make anything worse. I mean, just eat a potato instead of bread. Like that that seems like the simplest solution to not be riding your cane on the floor all day. Um, now the other. 90% of the population that doesn't have symptoms is where we start to get into a very interesting discussion that I think people need to be a little bit more cautious about, right? You've kind of got people who say, everybody's going to die of Alzheimer's from gluten because it causes this subclinical autoimmune response, it's destroying your brain, it's causing you to get fat, all these things. Or you've got people who say, if you don't have celiac, you don't have some sort of overt response, you're an idiot for a week. Um, I think there's I think there's a, a room to actually think about logic, right? Is the data to show that uh, people who don't have celiac or non gluten sensitivity, that their that their risk of actually developing something like Alzheimer's or some other chronic condition, rheumatoid arthritis, etc., from consuming gluten appears to be fairly small. The risk appears to be, you know, fairly minor from what we can tell. Now, the detriment of deciding to not eat it also appears to be almost minuscule, right? So you kind of can, um, well, what I do in the article, um, and when we release it, it'll probably help kind of clarify it a little bit, is you can put people into responders and non-responders, celiacs and non-celiacs, and you can show, you know, who benefits and who's harmed. And the, the real story is, if you don't have celiac or you don't have gluten sensitivity, is there's no harm from eating gluten free, um, but there's also not a substantial risk of eating it that we know to date. So it's kind of one of those things where if you don't have any response um, and you get a lot of life satisfaction out of eating it, you're probably going to be okay. Um, if you're somebody who doesn't have a response and Eating gluten most of the time is no big deal to you. There's no harm in doing that either. So that's kind of the way I I think about it personally. Same approach we had with dairy. They were saying, uh, you know, everybody was dairy free, and then uh, was it, a research came out that said uh, gluten by itself it doesn't help with inflammation or with celiac disease. You need to get uh, dairy out, and then you'll be fine. But then we will take out dairy, we're going to put out gluten, we're going to stop breathing, we're going to start drinking water. I don't know. 
There's a picture of that. It's one of my favorite pictures. It's full light light cubes that says like a dairy free vegan taking the outside. <laughs> so it's kind of one of those don't play on uh on diet or something. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You've got any other questions? I've got yeah, I've got a million. Am I free to crack on? Um <laughs> yeah. Yeah, keep going. <laughs> just, I'm going to continue with that topic actually, just because I promised some people I, I, I'd ask somewhere. So, if we're going on the, the research I've read or, or some of the data that I've seen suggests that it could be, if you do have a sensitivity to gluten, it could be more of an IBS type issue. And of course, if that leads on to certain diets like, like FODMAP diets, things like that. And I think obviously the data for something like FODMAP diets, a FODMAP diet is very inclusive. Um, but but, you know, we, does, everyone, does everyone know what that maps are? Um, so, do you, would, you, would you subscribe that kind of thought process to anyone who has symptoms with foods that we take or any issues using foods, diets like that, that actually focus on simple sugars, um, reducing those to avoid irritating the microbiome? Yeah, so there's that. There's, there's very interesting research actually that has looked at trying to figure out whether it's gluten itself, whether it's fat mass, um, and what it really is that causes a lot of these people who have this, this GI distress to some of these foods. And that, the best way I can distill it down is it appears that there is, depending on what research study you look at, it, you, you can make the claim that it's just the thought map. Um, and so people who have responses to gluten should try and remove the, the gluten and the thought map. Um, you know, one of the rationales is there are studies that just give people just straight gluten or gluten proteins or variety of proteins um, and they don't have a response of when you know there's thought maps involved, there is. So it's kind of one of those things where if you've got this this clinical manifestation of something is you know, you basically just have to say, okay, it could be this or it could be this, um, and let's just try to pin down personally what it is. Last question, uh, and, and we're let's heat it up a bit before we. Uh... <laughs> All right. Okay. So um, we're having a job. Uh, back before about uh, Kevin Hall and the newest research came out. Yeah. Like uh, Taub's uh, team? Yeah. Uh, Gary Sports, who said that uh, obesity yeah. is a disease of uh, insulin, high levels of insulin. Alan has goosebumps now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you, um, with regards to Kevin's research, when I, when I try to interpret him, correct me if I'm wrong here, but he basically said that he thought that a low-fat diet, or the low-fat diet he used, that was uh, reported lower body fat levels, was uh, created because obviously the fat cells were absorbing the fat in the high-fat diet. Um, is that correct to say? Would you would you agree with that? Because uh, obviously, would you, do you think it should have been a longer study? Do you think it would have showed the same results? If, what was the second part of that question? Pardon me? If it had been a longer study, because it was only, I mean, I thought it was, it was a two week study, you said six days, um, but it was a very short study, wasn't it? Do you think it would have shown the same results if it had gone on for four weeks? Um, so I think there's, uh, the, the answer is I don't know. Uh, I can postulate some ideas. What should I, I think like? some of the, <laughs> I think some of the, some of the problems with these um, short-term acute studies is, you know, our body does a lot of really interesting, almost rapid adjustments. Um, so one of the things that, I think it was uh, Dr. Stefan DNA, he had an analysis of the, the ketogenic study that they did, the one that was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, and he talked about, you know, how uh, initially in that ketogenic diet study, you saw this initial uptake of energy expenditure um, and then it dropped and there was some mechanisms of you know you've got gluconeogenesis going on about that time frame and an increase in amino acid metabolism and so there's some of these acute responses and I think that there's his Kevin's idea that 
Uh, there's an adaptation of fat cells to this restricted fat diet versus um, the the higher fat diet in the short term. I think it might be possible. Now, whether that um, I don't I don't think he provided any includes any evidence to suggest that was the case. I think he would have had to do some fat biopsies and look at um, you know some some enzyme markers and do some other stuff to actually substantiate that at all. But I think what you have to do is you have to realize these acute fluctuations um, to deal with changes in in metabolism and nutrient availability don't always manifest long term, right? It is after there's this initial adjustment period, things stabilize, things move around, and then 12 weeks. Now the problem is we're probably never going to get that study, right? Doing a 12 week metabolic ward study um, is prohibitively expensive. So unless uh, you guys know some very wealthy people who want to throw some money at a study, <laughs> we may not ever have that answer, right? So, but I think I think there's some ways you can get around that. Um, one of the key things would have to be a lot of biopsy studies because you have to interrogate the tissue at a at a tissue cellular molecular level, to kind of figure out some of those things. So any further research, but coming out with big words and you know. Like, this is bad. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit frustrating as when Gary Tubbs came up and said about ketogenic diet from low fat. It was, yeah. It was yeah. fun. So, thank you a lot for your time. Thank you. So it was much. amazing. Emotional. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, I really appreciate you guys having me on. It's uh, it's always a blast to, to talk to people and, you know, kind of start these conversations. We can uh, tell us about where, where we can find you. We can also uh, add the links, uh, like Science Driven Nutrition. I don't know if you still have Azure Fit. Uh, no, so the thing is through, uh, is through Science Driven Nutrition right now is where all my writing is. Um, all of the like coaching that I do is with uh, Eat to Perform. Um, that's kind of our our application of a lot of these things to, to the real world um, and trying to get you know, uh, one of our big things is the education piece of, you know, how do we take a lot of this misinformation that leads people down to, you know, less than enjoyable paths to trying to better their health and their fitness and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's that's how we do, we try to reach the average human being. So I'm going to put the links on also for your podcast um, and your webpage. Um, Perfect. Merry Christmas. Happy, yeah. Happy New Year. You're happy, happy, happy. I think, is it, is it Box Day there that you guys call it? What, uh, what is it, Box Day? 26? 26. And also, uh, I know you're going to be busy in the summer, but you know. Nice. You have, well, uh, happy Boxing Day. Yeah, you have an open invitation for Greece because you told me about food and scene and stuff, so. A bit of a romance. Yeah. It's about a romance. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, probably, uh, it'll probably be a little bit, but I'm definitely going to try to get back over there. It's, I spent some time there a few years ago and really enjoyed it, so I'll have to come back. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, guys. Take care. Bye.